Welcome to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Brandon Miller. Brandon is a certified strengths coach through the Gallup organization and has been coaching and training strengths for over 15 years. He's the CEO of 34 Strong, an employee engagement and strengths-based development consultancy. Today, we're going to be discussing his book, Play to Their Strengths, a new approach to parenting your kids as God made them. Let's ask Brandon five good questions. But first, I'm happy to announce my literary debut, The Rebel Allocator, is now available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. You could say it's about time. I've been pouring my heart into this book for more than three years. A well-known SoCal billionaire received an early copy of the book and actually called me to say he enjoyed the story and was adamant that I get it made into a movie. Talk about a surreal experience getting 20 minutes on the phone with one of my heroes. My friend Tobias Carlyle had this to say. Jacob Taylor has written a modern-day investment classic. The Rebel Allocator is reminiscences of a stock operator for value investors. It's a fictionalized retelling of the lessons in The Intelligent Investor in an accessible page-turner. If you want to learn how to invest like Warren Buffett by sitting at his knee, this is the book for you. Wow, how flattering is that? I was blown away when he sent me that. I've created dozens of ad-free author interviews over the last five years and never asked for anything in return. If you've gotten any value out of these efforts, please do me a personal favor and pick up a copy of The Rebel Allocator. I promise you won't regret it. And now, on with the show. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. My guest today is Brandon Miller, and he's the author of Play to Their Strengths. Hey, Brandon, uh, thanks for coming on the show today. My pleasure, Jake. Thanks for having me. So as a parent myself of a couple of young little rascals, um, you know, I... I, I've read a few parenting books, but maybe not enough, and uh, so I appreciated a chance to get a little, uh, especially from uh, someone who's an expert in the strengths kind of based world. So uh, this this one hit home for me. Awesome, glad to hear it. So question number one: uh, Can you explain to us this equation that you've created? That's it's basically talents times investment equals strength. Yeah, I sure can. So this equation comes right from the book Strengths Finder 2.0 written by Tom Rath. So Tom um, is the grandson of Donald Clifton. These are the strengths-based movement pioneers, people that thought about what would happen if we shifted the focus of human development from a traditional, what they refer to as the deficit assumption approach to development. We're going to look at a kid. We're going to see what it is that they do well, what they don't do well, and we're going to put our resources into areas where they're not as strong. And what what was proposed really to the world was, well, what if we shifted? What if we just started to identify talent, which are simply recurring patterns, identifiable places where you can see interest, you can see involvement, you can see some energy going toward a direction. And what if that's where we invested? We practiced, we put time, we put resources behind it. Could we end up with a strength? And and I love how they define a strength, really uh, just sustained ability to be really great at something. So you could call it sustained excellence. Um, you could just call it you know, repeated uh, results that really, to any third-party observer, uh, would be standout performance. So I've always found that to be interesting, this, this idea of, uh, you know, you think about like, oh, well, you're not good at this, so let's, let's get you better at it and make you more well-rounded. Uh, what's, what's kind of the fallacy of, of that? Well, I, I'll use an example with my daughter. So my daughter is relatively close to being a straight A performer, except in math. <laughs> so so she's 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 brought home several report cards, all A's, a C in math. And and as a parent, you, you know, the proclivity would be, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on math. So, you know, Madeline, let's get you in some math tutoring. We're gonna resolve it. And by percentage, a parent might spend 80% of their time there and maybe 20% on the positive marks. Well, doing that certainly would help my daughter be better in math. However, is that where her interest is? Is that where she's going to find sustained success? Or maybe the clue to that talent times investment is, let's look at these A's. Let's see where she's already performing well. And and one year we took that challenge. We actually said, okay, Madeline, we're gonna we're gonna get to the C later, but I'm gonna we're gonna spend 80, 90 percent of our time on your positive marks. We're gonna build up your confidence. We're going to help you increase competence overall. Um, we're even going to see if we can't add to your creativity. And then, you know, we'll come back to math. And and in reality, Madeline could Im- make some improvements there. Uh, but I would tell you, um, she's not really interested yeah. <laughs> long term. I don't see that being her major in college. But there are other areas where she shines. And that's what we've 
really look to do is helping them move down that path. So that's a good segue to question number two, which is, you know, we always tell our children that they can be anything they want to be if they work hard enough, right? And that's a that's yeah. a very common refrain. Um, but I was surprised in your book when you called that a lie. Uh, and right. so, what? Why is such a common idea wrong? I think I think we uh, all love this idea of well roundedness. We we want to help people be well rounded. It's instilled in us in our in our parenting uh, experiences or guardian experiences. It's it, it's instilled in us in our education and absolutely in our management life when we're being managed or our managers. So we, we, we tend to think of success in terms of, well, if you're well-rounded and then we can put maximum effort into one area and see outstanding results. And, and there are you know these incredible cases where the underdog comes through or the impossible shot makes it big. But in reality, human beings are, are designed – to have excellence and brilliance in certain areas over others. And we see that with areas where, you know, we have enthusiasm toward it or it comes natural to us or, or the big indicator is it gives us energy. So we like to draw a distinction between um, and a, a person's ability to really walk in a strength. Um, we actually refer to that as a very simple question. What is it that you do that when you finish doing it, it makes you feel strong? And, and the key to that question is no one can tell you or I, Jake, what makes us feel strong. Someone can look at us and go, well, wow, you're a great performer here. You're a great performer there. But that's different than when we walk out feeling like three hours felt like 30 minutes. Yeah. Or, or I want to go back to it so often that even when it's hard, even when you know I have to p- face adversity, I will stay resilient. And that's really where the fallacy starts to to to. Uh, or the, the the lie essentially is shown for what it is, is that we can't get there. Do I have time for one story? Absolutely. So there was a parent in the midst of a talk, and, and CEOs, um, typically when they're in front of each other, um, they only share to a certain point as far as just you know exposing themselves and, and uh, allowing for some scrutiny. Well, in this particular room of CEOs I had the opportunity to speak to, one of them um, at the conclusion of a talk with questions just like this, said, oh my goodness, hand, hands in her you know, face and just said, I, I can't believe what I did to my daughter. And tears started to come down her face. She said, uh, I wanted my daughter to do what I did, go down a path of science and um, to follow the things that I uh, love and I do well. She said, but my daughter hates it now. <laughs> she has no interest. She's gone completely away from it. And I was able to encourage the mom that, you know, that's a common mistake. We as parents, well-meaning, love our kids. We want to you know, sort of cattle them into a path that we think is best. And what ends up happening or can happen is the child veers, says, nope, I'm not going there. So I was able to encourage the mom, it's never too late for a do-over. You can start to play to your kid's strengths early. And and we're not trying to create a well-rounded kid. We're trying to create something that looks more like a star, you know, where there's areas of brilliance followed by areas where you're going to need other people. You're going to need others to help fill in those gaps. So it almost makes me wonder if um... – if when a kid is rebelling, it's it's more because they're pushing against like the, the preconceived notion that you're kind of forcing on them. And maybe if you were in their strength zone, they rebellion wouldn't even really be of interest to them. Yeah, it's a different it's a different autonomy. Right. So as a child, if I know that, wow, you're setting me up for success, you're helping me become things that are already feeling like to me that I could do really well. And and there's two really strong facets to this. There's strength that just looks innate. It's the stuff that you start to see, you know, with little ones, Jake, you can start to watch things, you know, that they're drawn to and do. You're like, Oh wow, I can start to spot some strength there. And then there's things that we as, as parents and caregivers go, I see a potential strength and I could start to see if I, if I help them invest there that they could grow it. And that's what, that's our job as parents. Our kids' strengths are not meant to be a mystery. We're meant to know where where to help guide them. But the tricky one is when we can get them to perform and they could do really well. But over time, they start to show the signs of, no, this isn't where I want to be. This isn't where I'm going to really thrive. And that's where engagement comes in. It's one thing to perform. It's another to stay engaged in it. And and that's, I think, your you know, great observation is that's where we as parents can start to catch you know, a real, a real strong threshold there of uh, where we put our energy. So question number three, uh, in your book, you talk about 
the bef- a before and after picture of your family. Uh, yeah. And in, in it, what has what has changed between the before and after, and what does that mean? To, like, how do you measure success uh, as as that picture uh, in in relation to that picture? Absolutely. So, I in the book we we really try to paint the picture in chapter one of just typical uh, approach to parenting, top down, very hierarchical, uh, very much driven by I say, you do, and. And, you know, just to be fair, that's what I was taught. It's what my wife was taught. It's what their parents were taught. And I can't call fault to that because it's just, you know, you you think of you have kids and you need to marshal them to do what you need them to do. Well, what that unfortunately leads to is a steady diet of command and control. So you're, you're really trying to get compliance over a commitment. And so the installation of value becomes I want you to be, say, and do because that reflects on me a certain level of status. And when Annalyn and I could strip away all of the intention and activity and get down to, you know, at the end of the day, we were parenting these kids to make us look good. Yeah, the the ego of parenting. (laughs) Absolutely. And they catch on quickly. Kids kids are quick, and they start to catch on, okay, then I'm going to make you pay for it. I will do (laughs) behavior in such a way that you will have to give corresponding incentives for me to continue to comply. And we we locked into the game full full stock. You do well, you get this incentive. You don't do well, I withhold incentive. And now we're bartering and trading with our kids. And it comes down to the classic, Jake, tell me if you've heard this. One, yeah. <laughs> two, <laughs> don't make me get the three. So in, in evaluating that, as our kids got to our the first three, so we have seven children, so three that are now in their 20s, and then we have about an eight-year gap, and then we have four more. So with our older three, as they got into their teenage years, we began to notice a great chasm opening up. We began to notice, gosh, we're just not connecting. Our, our old tricks of how we got compliance are not working. These are autonomous people now. And we realized we, we need to shift this, and, and you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for learning a different approach and, and having the opportunity to think differently about the kids. And so we started to measure different things. We started to look at how does my kids' countenance tell me about their engagement? So do their eyes shine? Do their faces smile? Do they, do they demonstrate, when I ask them a question, an interest in investment in the relationship with us as their parents? They want to talk. They want to share. They want to open up. And we began to gauge, all right, are we, are we engaging with them? Do they, do they want to bring us their struggles? Do they want to sit us down and say, you know, I really messed up here or I need help there? That began to open up a different way of measuring success. We started to look for ways that, that we watched them start to stand out and thrive instead of just following the rules. Right. So that command and control only works for, for so long. Uh, until there's going to be a rebellion, right? There, there has to be because it only lasts as long as all of the all of the standards stay exactly the same. So everything has to stay yeah. static, and we can't pull that off. Parents can't pull that off. Even many, even like the life. the threat of physical like control eventually I, goes away. Like the kids get stronger than you eventually, right? <laughs> absolutely, and and you have a you have a you have a get you have a window of time. That if we start, you know, young, so parents with younger kids, and we start to develop this relationship of, I'm here for your good. I'm here to help you become who you're made to be. And we want to to work together. I'm partnering because though I might have the steering wheel for the first 10, 12, 13, 14 years, eventually I got a ride shotgun. Eventually I got to move over, literally and figuratively, right? Yeah. And say, okay, you're driving now. Now I might have one of those, you know, fancy brake pedals like the driving schools have to keep you safe, but I'm setting them up for, hey, eventually I got to get out of this car. Eventually you got to drive now. I have to prepare you to be a functioning, thriving adult in the world. And if I over, you know, try to control things, I'm not setting you up for success. Right. <clears throat> so question number four, uh, What's this idea of a, a positive sandwich and when it comes to discipline? So with our kids, we, we try to practice what we heard referred to as the magic ratio. Magic ratio is for every one negative interaction or you could say discipline or sometimes even punitive. You know, we're, we're, we're doling out some kind of consequence. 
to balance that with five positive interactions. And and this is not easy to do because That's negative hard. interactions, yeah, negative interactions are very subjective. I might think I'm just asking you to do a thing, but there may be something going on at school, something going on, you know, with a challenge in with a friend group that I'm not even aware of that my comments are creating a negative response. And so paying attention to our kids tells us I I literally want to try to keep a score. I want to keep track of when am I engaging with them in such a way that that I'm staying on the positive end of that curve. So the positive sandwich looks like this. Inevitably, we need to have corrective conversations. Uh, we do not advocate for for parenting that allows for kids to run the show. That is not our plan. Um, we're not permissive parents. Uh, we believe that we have been entrusted with a very important role to guide these young minds that aren't fully capable of logical decisions yet. <laughs> they don't reason yet to help them guide. And when they go off, not if, when they go off course, to bring them back. So, so you know, constructive, corrective conversations are important and corrective measures are important. It's, it's part of understanding the consequence of reality. So positive sandwich starts with, I want to observe something you did or something behind what you did that I can call out. Because behind almost every act of defiance, disobedience, some area of a poor choice, there's something under that that we can find a strength, a talent. Even talents used for unhelpful purposes are still potential talents. So I've noticed this. But now we need to correct this thinking. Now we need to talk about what took place. And then at the end, but I want you to know that that what I see here and the potential you have and the places where they go. So now I'm painting a picture of where we could take this, a positive outcome, um, giving hope. Because what our kids need from us, just like you and I need from anyone we are going to follow, is they need to trust us. And one of the primary indicators of whether a kid will trust us is can they tell us the truth? Can they be open? Can they acknowledge failure and weakness without feeling judged, without mm-hmm. feeling like, oh, here it comes. You know, Now I'm just going to have the consequence. So we try to we try to stick to that. I'll tell you, Jake, it's a it's a life work in progress <laughs> <laughs> because then there's frustration and we get, you know, depending on the level of offense, you know, you get you can, you know, with you can imagine with, you know, now four teenagers, I've seen all kinds of ways for my kids to offend us. <laughs> you know, so we start to think through how do we help you kid get to an outcome where you believe I'm I'm on your side. I'm going to help you move to that area. And, how many negative patties can you have within your your sandwich you know yeah. to positive <laughs> it's it's a challenge because this is you know we we give an example in our book of Anna Lynn keeping score with with one of the kids just in a typical morning interaction and she was she was surprised by how easy it is to have negative interactions you know son why didn't you remember to take the garbage out or you you're always forgetful other son or you're and these these words they start to stack, right? So that positive, the negative, um, it's fascinating the research behind it and what it does to a relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably true of anybody you interact with, right? But I mean, even more so with your kids. Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> so, question number five: What's the most common mistake that that you see parents making, and and a possible solution? So hands down, the most common mistake a parent can make is trying to be someone they're not. So we, we, we hear and speak to and listen to parents often talk about trying to, to fake it till they make it. (laughs) They're trying to come up with solutions. They're trying to compare themselves to other parents. And unfortunately with today's social media reality, there's a whole lot of fake people out there (laughs) who are presenting the almost perfect view of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you get a mom who is not uh, a designer. She's not an arts and crafts person. She's not, this isn't her thing, but she's going to try to be that person. She's going to try to be someone she's not. So inauthentic parenting um, is, is really a trap because it sets a person up for imposter syndrome. And, and very simply, whether it's the actual syndrome or just the, the, the symptoms of it, you're just starting to try to be someone you're not. And, and you have this underlying apprehension of, gosh, what if I get found out? <laughs> what if they find out I'm not really here? So that inauthenticity 
we, we really encourage parents, let's figure out what you are good at as a mom or a dad. And let's play to your strengths. Let's figure out, you know, if you're a, a, an amazing, you know, uh, creative parent, and I'll use a dad that knows how to go out and make the forts or the tree houses or, you know, build things with their kid, then be that dad. <laughs> be that dad. Do those things. Um, but if you're not that dad, I'm not that dad. <laughs> if you're not that dad, then it's okay. If your son wants to be, your daughter wants to be creative, find other influencers in their life that can help promote that without feeling in any way that that's a step down or admission of weakness. Um, because, you know, my son is is interested in field and, and uh, you know, hunting and fishing and, you know, things like this. And that is not his dad. <laughs> that never was his dad. Yeah. And so we now, my son's an adult, We've started to look for others that can teach us to to do that. Now, his level of interest far exceeds mine. So he's taking it to all kinds of levels, and the, the student has become the teacher. He teaches dad how to fish with the right lure, how to look for the right opportunity. And, and that authenticity, uh, I tell you, what it does to you as a parent is you can you can just exhale. <sighs> you're okay. You're being you, and you're allowing – for what all our kids will have, trusted advisors that we bring in and out, their teachers, their coaches, their family members that can help influence. And there's something kind of nice about the idea of of your kids getting better than you at something and teaching you something and not feeling like you have to be Superman all the time. It's it's liberating because then I can I can be who I am, Annalyn can be who she is, and you know, my brother is is particularly handy. So if something breaks in his house, he's going to fix it. Um, I have no problem admitting I'm not. And and I have tried, not for lack of effort. I, I tried to learn how to be that person and realize I could put the same amount of time and energy resources into this, or I can call a repair person, <laughs> or I can call my brother. Yeah. And if my child wanted to learn how to do an addition to their home, we'd call Uncle Ryan. <laughs> Uncle Ryan come and, and share with them. Um, but if they wanted to learn how to to do something, you know, more of like writing a book or, you know, engaging in business or having financial conversations, then that's where I feel like I can step in and have that opportunity. That's great. I, I love the idea of where like strengths kind of meet a confluence together um, between two people. And now it's like it really starts, the harmonizing starts happening. That's right. So bonus question we always ask, and this is for a book recommendation. Uh, and so what do you have for us today? The Strength Switch by Dr. Lee Waters. Uh, in in the world of strengths based development, I think Dr. Waters has written one of the most comprehensive books that really help us to understand why this switch is so difficult. So, if you can imagine a light switch, so switching from a a weakness way of thinking to a strengths way of thinking, uh, it's awesome. Now, it happens to be a parenting book, but I'll tell you, as an organizational development consultant. We recommend this book, Parents or Not. Uh, she's out of Melbourne, Australia. She travels the world. I think her book is now in four languages, uh, maybe going on a fifth. And uh, I just can't commend it. It's been out two years now. And uh, I, I really would call that a fantastic read. Well, that's great. Uh, Brandon, thanks for coming on the show today and um, hopefully making all of us a little bit better parents. Thank you, Jacob. It's great to be here. Before you go, do me the huge honor of picking up your copy of The Rebel Allocator, available on Amazon in both print and digital formats. It's a business person's guide to effective capital allocation, told in a coming-of-age story of a college grad who crosses paths with a wealthy Midwesterner. It's fiction for the nonfiction reader. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you'd like to support this author and purchase their book, click here. If you'd like to become a subscriber to 5GQ, click here. And I included a couple other interviews that you might appreciate right here. Thanks. Happy reading.